coding. Yeah. So uh, welcome, everyone. And um, as usual, if you wish to subscribe to our mailing list and get warnings of the future seminars, you can send the word webinar to our email or to our WhatsApp number, which you can find in the chat. And just the same, you can check future talks and previously recorded talks, uh, respectively, on our website and our YouTube channel. So I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Daniel Fadell. He's my former PhD student. Now he's a researcher at the Fluminense Federal University and is going to tell us about the asymptotic geometry of G2 monopoles. Yeah, go ahead, Daniel. Great. So thank you, Enrique. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak here. Um, uh, a few remarks before we start. Uh, this is all joint. Uh, this talk is based on joint work with uh, Akos Nag and Gonzalo Oliveira, and is available uh, on the archive. Uh, at least uh, first version of this work, this paper. Um, and is entitled uh, the asymptotic geometry of the two monopoles. And I should remark that this is a more geometric analysis talk. Uh, the paper is, is quite long, and uh, the uh, the proofs are, are a bit technical. And I will try to do my best to to explain the main ideas uh, behind the the analytical uh, technical. Uh, details. Um, so, I want to start by giving you an, an overview of the of what I'm going to talk about, and uh, the context here is G2 geometry, which occurs in seven dimensions. And uh, in fact, G2 is one of the exceptional cases in the classification of possible holonomy groups that a uh, remaining manifold can carry. And uh, one of the some of the important features of uh, uh, G2 anonymity, uh, sorry, my, my, uh, of G2 anonymity manifolds are that uh, they are Ricci flat and, and they also admit uh, non zero parallel spinner fields. Uh, because of these reasons, they are also uh, important to theoretical physics. Um, so, as you know, uh, Berger's classification dates back to 1953. And uh, by that date, uh, there were no examples of G2 holonomy matrix. But uh, since then, nowadays, we have plenty of examples. And in fact, we have uh, a very powerful methods to construct G2 holonomy matrix, both in the compact setting and the non-compact setting. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, there are, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, three um, known constructions of G2 holonomy matrix on the compact setting that produce millions of examples. And, uh, and also there are uh, quite a few constructions uh, of non-compact G2 holonomy manifolds, uh, which gives you infinite families of, of these guys. Uh, but uh, these constructions uh, are not that explicit uh, in fact, in the compact case, uh, special Ricci flat special holonomy matrix should be taught as transcendental objects. In fact, there is no explicit example of a G2 holonomy metric on a compact manifold. And all these constructions are non explicit, uh, they, they are based on an existence theorem. Um, and in, in, in the non compact case, there are a few, just a few uh, explicit examples, but the the more recent work by Foscolo, Nordstrom, and Hoskins uh, uh, that produce infinite families of examples of these metrics are actually based in, on uh, cohomogeneity one methods and uh, reducing some nonlinear PDE to an ODE. And they use uh, uh, qualitative methods to, to prove the existence of solutions of these ODE. So these metrics are not explicit. Uh, uh, besides uh, I don't know, just a few of them. Um, so there's no systematic understanding of these metrics. 
And in fact, one of the most impor important problems in the two geometry is to develop methods to distinguish these, uh, these manifolds. And you can put this problem in several ways. Uh, there, by now, there is there's uh, an invariant, an analytic invariant by Crowley Nordstrom uh, that detects uh, different connected components of the G2 matrix moduli space. But uh, our under understanding of these moduli space is, is, is quite uh, not developed. It's, it's, it's essentially local. And, uh, and one approach to, to try to define invariants of G2 manifolds by means of higher dimensional gauge theory. And uh, these higher dimensional gauge theoretical equations were first proposed by uh, Donaldson Thomas and Donaldson Siegel, at least in the mathematical literature. Uh, and one of these, uh, so, so by trying to mimic the, success, the successful theory of Donaldson in uh, uh, Donaldson's theory in four dimensions, that uh, used moduli space of instantons to define invariants of four manifolds, and also you can see uh, cyber Witten theory. Uh, one can try to mimic uh, these theories in higher dimensions by using, by studying solutions of certain higher dimensional gauge theoretical equations. And one of these equations is the monopole equation uh, in seven dimensions, the G2 monopole equation. And G2 monopoles are special pairs consisting of a gauge field and a Higgs field. A gauge field is just a connection on a principal bundle over a manifold, and a Higgs field is, is a, a section of a associated a joint bundle. Uh, don't worry, I will uh, explain these in more details in the next few slides. Um, that satisfy a seven dimensional analog of the Bogomoni monopole equation in three dimensions. And in fact, uh, in the same way that the monopole equation in three dimensions is, is a dimensional, comes from a re dimensional reduction from the AST instanton equation in four dimensions, the D2 monopoles comes from a dimensional reduction of the spin seven instanton equation. Spin seven is one of the two together with G2 exceptional cases in Perger's classification. And it's strictly related to G2 geometry because G2 sits inside the spin seven, so you can build uh, reductive uh, spin seven manifolds out of G2 manifolds by by uh, taking remaining project with uh, real line on S1, um, and then by dimensional reduction you get G2 monopoles. And G2 monopoles are moreover critical points of uh, certain energy functional related to the young Mills higgs functional, uh, which uh, we call the intermediate energy functional, which, uh, and, and in fact, as I will show to you today, if you're setting uh, uh, under suitable assumptions, uh, the G2 monopoles are in fact uh, absolute minima for this energy functional. And so if you, if you want, if you have any hope to define an enumerative invariant out of the moduli space of G2 monopoles, uh, then you should know how these guys uh, behave. And it turns out that G2 monopoles lives in com non-compact manifolds, if you are talking about smooth G2 monopoles and uh, pure monopoles. Uh, and uh, so you, you should uh, analyze the asymptotic behavior of these, of these guys and uh, to hope that uh, you get some Fred Holm setup for your moduli theory and uh, choose, uh, know how to choose appropriate functions, weight functions to, 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 to give a Fred Holm setup to this theory and, and, and have a good moduli theory. So, our results gives us uh, sharp decay rates for G2 monopoles under just uh, natural assumptions such as finite intermediate energy, which is uh, the most natural assumption um, in this context, uh, as I will argue in the next few slides, uh, 
uh, and actually the only known examples of non-trivial G2 monopoles have finite intermediate energy and have infinite young music energy. And uh, we give uh, also decay rates uh, for the linear linearized equations. And this, the, the upshot, I mean, the, the, the punchline of this work is that uh, we, we actually uh, give uh, 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 the appropriate hint for a Fred Home setup describing the moduli space of these guys. Uh, in a very general, uh, uh, under very general assumptions. Okay, so before I move on, there's any questions? Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. It's all good. Okay. So let me give you some some background uh, um, of, about G two manifolds. Very quick. So a G two structure on a seven manifold is defined by a can be defined by a tree form satisfying a certain non degeneracy condition. Uh, from which it defines a unique remaining metric and volume form on the manifold such that this equation right here holds. Uh, I put I put this equation because it, it gives you uh, the, the, the notion of non-degeneracy condition that we impose. And also it shows you uh, how, how the, uh, the form phi uh, defines the remaining metric in the volume form in a very nonlinear way. This should be compared with, uh, for instance, scalar geometry when you have remaining metric G and uh, omega and J and to the way one determines T the other. This is a very highly nonlinear way to define these other two guys. I uh, will set Side to be the Hodge dual of phi with respect to the remaining metric it induces. So this is nonlinear on phi. And a tor uh, torsion free G2 structure is a G2 structure for which uh, the remaining, the leave the connection of the induced remaining metric uh, leaves it this, the, the G2 structure parallel. And uh, there's a theorem by Fernandez and Gray which shows you that this condition is equivalent to the closedness and co-closedness of the G2 structure. This equation right here is linear on phi, but this equation right here is very nonlinear on phi. And this is very difficult to solve. In fact, I was telling you that uh, there's no explicit examples of the compact manifolds. And uh, the, the common feature of the all three known uh, methods to construct uh, torsion free G2 structures on the compact setting is that they first use gluing techniques to, to construct a closed G2 structure in their manifold uh, with a sufficiently small under certain appropriate functional analytic norms. Torsion, meaning this guy is small in an appropriate sense, and then invoke a general existence theorem of Joyce to perturb the G2 structure to a torsion-free nearby one. So they are all non-explicit. Uh, when the torsion, the, the G2 structure is torsion-free, this pair will be called G2 manifold, and from now on, we will be dealing with G2 manifolds. So some facts that are important to us, uh, so this, this this is, can be seen as another way to, to define G2 manifold as a remaining seven manifold whose holonomy group is contained in G2. This follows from the holonomy principle uh, because G2 can be, thing, can be thought of as a uh, stabilizer under the general linear group action of uh, the standard G2 uh, structure on R7, which is given by this equation here when you take the metric to be the Euclidean one and the volume from the, the standard one. So if you live parallel this tensor, then the only group should be inside and vice versa. Uh, by the 
the restrictions of the Riemannian curvature tensor of a Riemannian metric, uh, uh, the, for instance, the they leave on the second symmetric power of the of the Lie algebra of the holonomy group, and also satisfied by NK identities. These conditions here impose very strong restrictions to the metric, and they turns out turn out to be Ricci flat. Uh, another fact that I use is that the G2 structure, even if it's not torsion free, it induces an, an orthogonal splitting of the uh, two forms of the manifold into irreducible G2 modules uh, by G2 representation theory, which are given uh, as the eigenspaces of this operator that uh, on two forms that wedges it with the G2 structure and then takes the hot star. So this is the uh, eigenspace associated to the eigenvalue two and this is the minus eigenvalue space. And it turns out that this guy here is precisely the copy of the Lie algebra of G2 inside the two forms. Uh, G2 sits inside SO7. And SO7 has a Lie algebra, which can be identified with the anti-symmetric matrix, can be identified with the two forms. So under this identification, this is just a copy of the Lie group G2, the Lie algebra. So one important condition that you can impose on a connection of, or on a bundle over a G2 manifold uh, could be that, is that the, you can impose that the curvature of this connection, which has a two-form part, lives inside the, the this part of the, this irreducible summand of the two forms. Um, this would be, a, this is a, a very natural geometrical constraint and it's, and it's called the G2 uh, instanton equation. Uh, in, uh, for the spin seven group, there is an, 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 analog, uh, an analogous story here, uh, and uh, you can decompose also the two forms into two irredu irreducible summons, and uh, one of which is a copy of the Lie algebra of spin seven, and the spin seven instanton equation is just that to, to impose that the curvature of your connection over a bundle over a spin seven manifold uh, lives in the, in the Lie algebra of the spin seven part of the, the two forms. What I will introduce to you now is uh, the G2 monopole equation, which is related to both of these equations that I mentioned before. And so to define things correctly, so for now on, this pair would be a G2 manifold. You take a principal G bundle over a manifold where G is a compact Lie group. For us, G will be all, always SU2. For concreteness, uh, actually, this will be uh, a hypothesis that, that I will use uh, in the next slides. Um, and we consider pairs consisting of a connection on this bundle and a section of this adjoint bundle associated to it, which we call a Higgs field. And this pair will be called the G2 monopole if it satisfies this first order nonlinear PDE, which is to take the, the, the curvature of the connection, wedge it with the Psi, which is the dual of the two, D2 structure. This is a six form, and you uh, ask it to be equal to the hot star of this one form, which is the covariant derivative of, uh, of phi. A G2 linear algebra fact tells you that this equation can be equivalently written in this way. And because of this, since phi is closed and co-closed, taking the exterior derivative of both of these equations uh, leads you to these equations right here, second order equations, which is called, which are called uh, young music equations. And, uh, they are actually the euler lagrange equation for the intermediate energy functional and also for the young Gilsley's energy functional. And uh, this guy here is, is, is defined as the, as the 
average of the L2 norm of nabla phi plus the L2 norm of this component of the curvature, which turns out to be three times the, the norm of the seven dimensional components in the curvature. In fact, we, we saw in the previous slide that when you wedge with psi, you kill the, the 14 dimensional part of the, of the two form. So this is an equation involving, in fact, this is uh, involving the seven dimensional part of the. So for a G2 monopole, this is just, uh, this is equal to this, and this is just the L2 norm of nabla phi. This is called the intermediate energy functional because this 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 just cor corresponds to the seven dimensional part of the curvature and the usual Young Mills Higgs energy functional uh, takes all the, the full curvature tensor here. Uh, over a pre-compact pre -compact open set with a smooth boundary, uh, we may rewrite uh, this energy functional but integrating by parts. In fact, if you look at this term here, if you take the inner product of this guy with itself, you get this, this term here, this term here, minus uh, the integral of the trace of the curvature wedge psi wedge star star of nabla phi. But this can be written as d of this guy right here because of the closedness of psi and by NK identity. So by Stokes theorem, you, you get this boundary term. Uh, from this, we can see that uh, if the manifold X is compact without boundary, and then you take U to be your whole manifold, you do this integration by part in your whole manifold, then this term should vanish. And this term vanishes precisely when you are a G2 monopole. So a G2 monopole on a compact manifold uh, will have this guy equal to zero because this, this will be zero and these L2 norms would be zero. And uh, our equation uh, reduces to the, the equation of the connection A to have uh, to be a G2 instant on F A wedge psi equals to zero. And, and the connection moreover uh, is reducible if phi is non-zero because uh, this derivative, this covariant derivative of phi would be zero. Uh, another uh, way to say this and to see this, this fact uh, is by noticing that this equation here of harmonicity of phi implies that this function here is subharmonic. And so it has no local maxima, and if we were to be in a compact setting, then it, it would be constant. And uh, the conclusion I, I took from the previous slide holds. And since we are interested in the pure or irreducible G2 monopoles, meaning that uh, we don't want this to be zero, we must have our, compact, uh, our manifold to be no compact. So to set the things uh, precisely, from now on, we will be dealing with a complete, non-compact, and irreducible G2 manifold of bounded geometry. So a few words about these hypotheses. So the non-compactness is already motivated. Completeness is because we are doing analysis. So we, we would like to have, and also the, the, the most important uh, examples of G2 matrix are complete. Um, are the complete ones, and, and we also want to do analysis, and uh, we we should have completeness and, and bounded geometry to to have uniform uh, geometric control on, on small geodesic balls and so forth. Uh, recalling that uh, a G two holonomy metric is Ricci flat, it follows from the irreducibility assumption, which is a, just a simplifying assumption. Uh, together with chigurh gramol splitting theorem, that X has only one end. What is an end of a, a manifold? If you have a complete and non-compact manifold, a remaining manifold, then it has at least uh, one uh, geodesic ray, which is half line. So it would be uh, unbounded. So if you take a large enough compact set, uh, uh, the complement of the, the connected components 
of the complement of this compact set will be unbounded. So you can have various ends of this manifold outside the compact set. But uh, each end can have its own asymptotic geometry. And I want to focus on just one asymptotic geometry, and then you can generalize for, for a manifold with more connected components at infinity. And, uh, and so I, I, I assume irreducibility, which uh, by the chigar gromov splitting theorem, uh, uh, doesn't allow the manifold to, to have a geodesic line and uh, connecting to two of the ends of the manifold and, and having more than one end. Uh, Dario, just a, just a quick comment. Uh, what, what you probably mean is that um, if a manifold had a second end, it would be an actual cylinder, right? So it would be yeah, it, That's it the will point. Be, yeah. Yeah. That's right. Because, that's what the because theory, it, that's a semi solar paper, right? And she proves that if you're Ricci flat, then you and, and you and uh, you have two or more ends, or the second end automatically makes it a cylinder. Yeah, because you will have a geodesic uh, line, and this and this can this would be your flat uh, direction because you can then exponentiate the normal, and then, yeah, you you, you will right. get. Uh, so, but but uh, I should mention that uh, this does not use Ricci flatness. Actually, it uses just the uh, that the Ricci is non-negative. Uh, but anyway, uh, by Bishop Gromov, and actually, plus an argument of Yao, using a clever a clever use of Bishop Gromov, you can you have also these lower bound by this argument of Yao and this upper bound by Bishop Kromov using the, that the rich curvature is uh, non-negative and the manifold is complete and non-compact. So yeah, the, the, the volume growth condition of the manifold will be important. So we know that we are between this, the linear case, which is the asymptotically cylindrical case and the maximal volume growth case, which is the asymptotically conical case. Okay, so let's enter into some analysis. Uh, can someone please tell me uh, how many minutes I have left? I, I don't. You have 22 more minutes. Okay, thank you. So I will try to uh, go through some of the main ideas in the proof of the main theorems that uh, and these, we will use some uh, geometric analysis uh, arguments, but I will try to do my best in, uh, for, for those of you that, which are not uh, used to analysis too much and are more dramatic uh, interested. So I will try to do, please uh, feel free to interrupt me. And uh, okay, so from now on, I will suppose that uh, I will have Always, this pair will be always a G2 monopole. And for this part, using just the yang Higgs equation, equations which are the, those uh, second order equations that we got from taking the exterior derivative of the G2 monopole equations, we get this identity here, which uh, I can explain it in the following way. If you compute the Laplacian of this function here, uh, by definitions, uh, you get this term here minus this term here. For this term here to compute it, you use a, a Weizenbach formula for this rough Laplacian to compare it with the Hodge Laplacian of A. And uh, for the Hodge Laplacian of A, we know something about uh, the, the Hodge Laplacian of the curvature and the Hodge Laplacian of the phi. So, so then we can compute this using the yang music Higgs equations and we get this term here. So forgetting about this positive term here and this non-negative term here and bounding this by a uniform constant times the, the this guy squared and the norm of the curvature, we get this Laplacian uh, inequality here. So if you see this uh, nabla phi squared 
the norm of number of phi squared as a function f, you got uh, that the Laplacian of f is less than or equal to a constant times f. This remind this is a linear perturbation of the of the subharmonic condition, which is to Laplacian of f less than or equal to zero. For subharmonic functions, you know that that the, its value in a, in a ball uh, in in the center of its ball is less than or equal to up to times its mean value in, in that ball. For a linear perturbation of uh, of this uh, of the condition of subharmonicity, you, you you have Moser iteration, which gives you uh, the same sort of bound on the on the function on the interior of the ball, and you get this term here, which is uh, how we bound this constant here. I bound this constant here by the Alvin infinity norm of the curvature on a ball, which is finite because we are in this smooth case. And this is just a ball, a pre-compact set. Um, and then this linear perturbation gives you this. If we hadn't this, this term, this would be just a mean value property. But with this, uh, we get this, this, this inequality here. And so if uh, this function here is integrable and our function is, in fact, our curvature is, in fact, bounded in the whole, on the whole manifold, then you actually get that this function here is in LP for any P uh, greater than one and the case uniformly to zero along the end. How do we see this? So if you, if you bound this guy by the infinity norm of uh, the curvature on the whole manifold and you fix R, this is just a constant fixed and independent of the point. So if you take a, a sequence of points escaping to infinity, meaning that uh, it eventually escapes any compact set of the manifold. And you apply this inequality with centers, the, the, the points of the sequence. This guy here will go to zero because it's, it's integrable in the whole manifold. And this is a constant. So this guy here goes to zero. And this uh, the supremum of, of the nabla phi squared on, on these balls escaping to infinity goes to zero. So this guy goes to zero, decays uniformly to zero along the end. And uh, it will be bounded, hence. Uh, uh, and being an uh, integral function and bounded function, it would be in LP for any P greater than one, right? But here we just used uh, the young Mills higgs equations. If we actually use the G2 monopole equation, then you can relate the norm of this guy with this. And by linear algebra, this guy equals three times the, the squared norm of uh, the seven-dimensional part of the curvature. Uh, and then if you, right here, you use Pythagoras theorem and, and, and bound this by f7 times this plus f14 times this, the f7 can be uh, is uh, bounded by this guy, so you get this this uh, uh, third power of this function, this function and, and this term here. So if you think, think again of this guy as a function f, then you got Laplacian of f less than or equal to a constant times some guy here times the f plus f to a nonlinear power now, three halves. So we have a further uh, perturbation of the uh, mean uh, of the subharmonic condition by a nonlinear term now. For this, to deal with this and get bounds such as the previous one, we need a type of result called epsilon regularity. And we need uh, to control uh, uh, the renormalized energy of, uh, I'm sorry, uh, this, I'm, I'm thinking about this as an energy. You need to control this uh, and have a monotonicity uh, inequality. What this means? Well, we, we are doing analysis, and these equations are, uh, if you scale the metric by, uh, by lambda squared, then, then uh, the pair A phi, uh, if you, you, you transform it by by multiplying the Higgs field by lambda to the minus one, 
this continues to be a solution to the Young Disease equation. And if you do this, this is scaling here on this integral, you will get, uh, because this is uh, a one form and you scale by lambda squared and you should scale this by minus, by lambda to the minus one, you, you will get that the, uh, the scaling variant L2 norm over of this guy is the one that you renormalize the, this integral by this factor here. And we, when you are doing analysis, you want your estimates to pass down to, to smaller balls, to be reasonable estimates. And we want to control this scaling variant L2 norm of, the, of this guy. And, uh, and the monotonicity tells you that you can pass down a control on this part to any concentric smaller ball. This, if, uh, as we are working with small radius ball, this will always be controlled as long as F14 is bounded. And the epsilon regularity results tell, tells you that uh, you have a universal constant epsilon such that if you control, if you get, if you have this smallness condition on the L, L on the renormalized L2 norm of number phi, then you control this nonlinearity here and you get something uh, uh, along the lines of the Moser iteration uh, uh, or mean value inequality bound, which is this one. So now we get this, this, this guy perturbating and this guy from the monotonicity. But now we can, we can actually conclude that uh, we need just the F14 part of the curvature to be bounded in order to conclude the same thing of the previous slide, because this guy will be bounded, bounded, and this we can, uh, uh, this is bounded in L1, so this will all be bounded, and we conclude this guy is 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 already bounded, but this guy is precisely, if this guy is bounded, then F7 is bounded, so F7 is bounded, F14 bounded, the whole curvature is bounded. And then by the previous result, we get that this guy decays and is in LP for all P. Why this will be important to us? So we get, we got, uh, we reached our first main result, which is to get finite intermediate, uh, sorry, to get finite mass from finite intermediate energy. What is a finite mass configuration? Is one for which the Higgs field norm at infinity converts to a constant m. And, and if you are familiarized, familiarized with the uh, three-dimensional Bogomolny equation, this parameter here uh, plays a very important role. Uh, and if we consider polynomial volume growth, recalling that our L is in between the linear and the maximal volume growth case, so then if we assume that we are at least, uh, the volume growth grows at least like R to the seven over two, the dimension over two, and we have a finite intermediate energy uh, monopole uh, with uh, F14 bounded, then it has automatically finite mass. I sketch a proof of this, it goes as follows. Um, so we define W to be uh, this function over here, where G is a positive ring function on our, on our manifold, which exists by, yes, by, by uh, the volume growth condition and, uh, and the other, condi other hypothesis I, I, I made in the beginning. Uh, by definition, this, uh, this function is the unique solution to this, to this equation right here. We know so that can this I, guy can I ask a question? Yes, yes, please. So, uh, so this finite mass definition. So this m should be a finite number, right? Or yes, yes. Okay. What I what I mean here is that uh, the norm of phi uh, this this limit exists and uh, sorry, uh, it goes to m uniformly mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, and yes. Uh, 
outside any not, compact stat. And x not is just x not is just any point or yeah, yeah, any any fixed base point on the manifold. Okay, I see, I see. And uh, so if, like, you, if you have, it doesn't matter have, because this is the limit along the tube, right? You can only compute this distance along a geodesic uh, 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 ray, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. and his manifolds only have one end, right? So you, you okay, can start okay. anywhere. It doesn't matter. You eventually leave any compact set. Okay, yeah. I see. I see. And uh, can so is there like any special cases when m is equal to zero? Ah, so uh, that, that's a great uh, observation that if if you have finite mass m, mm -hmm. recall that I proved that this norm of phi squared is subharmonic, right? Okay. So yeah. if, if at the end it uh, it converts to this constant m, so mm -hmm. in the whole manifold it should be bounded by m by the maximum principle, right? Okay, right, right. So if you have zero mass, then the whole uh, the Higgs field is zero. And uh, oh, we are in the reduced book, yeah. So, oh, so from now on, I, I will, on, right? It's just Higgs a purity to yeah. on. There's no yeah. Higgs field. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So this is a very. You're welcome. Uh, this is a very strong and, and nice condition uh, that we want to have, and uh, it fall. The the the, the big point here is that it's it follows from the from a natural assumption, which is finite intermediate energy. And actually, since the G2 monopole equation just controls uh, at first sight uh, the F7 part, it's natural to 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 ask boundedness of uh, the, 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 to, to, for this guy to be in infinity. In infinity. So these are pretty natural assumptions that uh, we were happy to 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 just need them to prove this. And so, so getting back to the, the sketch of proof. Um, so by construction, this, this function here is the unique so, uh, solutions that decays along the end uh, for, of this equation. And if you use the, the, the behavior of Green's function uh, and the fact that we proved that this guy is in LP for any P, then you uh, split this integral on a ball, use the small distance behavior of Green function, uh, and and the uh, and the other in the other side you on the other integral you use holder inequality and use this fact and you can actually prove that this guy is, is bounded by construction it is non-positive uh, sorry it's uh, non-negative and the key point is to show that this norm squared grows strictly lower is lower than lin than linearly why because this function here, if we define m squared to be this function, by construction, this is a harmonic function, which is non-negative. And since w is bounded, if we show this, we show that m squared is a harmonic function growing certainly lower than linearly. But by Chen Yao gradient inequality using rich flatness here, uh, such a function must, must be constant. So this will be a constant and we get what we want. So the, to prove the key part, you define this function here. This is the trick. You fix uh, base point. I used x not here, but in y here, but anyway. Uh, and since this is a subharmonic function, this supremum will be achieved on the boundary. And uh, by the growth, uh, by the volume growth assumption, we have a Sobolev a Sobolev holder embedding, embedding, uh, controlling the differences between, uh, I mean, controlling the holder norm uh, in terms of the uh, of this guy in terms of the LP norm of its gradient, and because of this and using this, uh, this guy which is phi in this point can be bounded by this constant plus uh, this distance to this to this power, which is a power which appears delta is positive because of this assumption here using this sublevel holder embedding. So this shows that this function grows strictly slower than linearly. So we get that. May I move on? Any questions? 
think you can wrap up in the five minutes. Okay, so the our fruitful ground uh, uh, to apply all of these is the asymptotic, asymptotically conical uh, geometry, which is the maxim, maximal volume growth case uh, that we were talking about. And just a quick definition, this guy said to be asymptotically conical if outside a, clo a compact set, uh, its end is, is, is modeled on, the, uh, on a cone, on a Riemannian cone uh, over a nearly Kähler six manifold in the sense that uh, its metric along the end uh, is asymptotic to the cone metric in a polynomial decay rate. And well, if you don't know it, what is a nearly Kähler man six manifold, it has a, a an almost complex structure and, and a fundamental one one form, which is related. These three are related in, in the usual way, uh, but d omega it's is not zero and omega is not closed. It's actually proportional to the, the real part of a complex three zero form that this manifold carries. And well, uh, we shall be calling R any positive smooth extension of the the this. Uh, uh, coordinate function of the cone. So the we shall use this notation to the truncation along the end up to length r. Uh, and this is the boundary. And one fact is that these manifolds has have maximal volume growth. So we can apply the previous result and and, and see if we can uh, obtain more than just uh, the previous asymptotic behavior on these manifolds. Uh, there are plenty of examples of asymptotically conical G2 manifolds, the three classical Bryant Salomon explicit examples, and uh, recent, recent, infinitely many new examples by the work that I mentioned before of Oskolo Haskin Nordstrom. These are all cohomogeneity one manifolds. And by using cohomogeneity one methods, Gonzalo Oliveira actually uh, constructed the only known non-trivial examples of G2 monopoles on these, on the on the on two of the Bright Salomon manifolds, which by the time uh, there were no there was no Oskolo Haskin Arson construction. And well, this this is based on reducing the nonlinear PDE for G2 monopoles to a, a no DE and doing some analysis of ODEs to, to prove that there exist solutions. And it turns out that in this AC case, we can we, got, we get the sharp decay rates for G2 monopoles. So if we suppose that we are in the AC case and the, the nearly K, the nearly K uh, uh, sorry, asymptotic cross section, which is the link of, uh, has this nearly killer structure omega j, and we assume that the structure group is SU2, then any finite intermediate energy two monopoles such that the F14 part decays, now we assume that this guy decays instead of just only to be bounded, we get the following. So nabla phi decays like the dimension minus one, r to the minus six, uh, these guys, which are, it turns out for G equals SU2 to be the transverse components of nabla phi and, and, and the curvature, they decay exponentially fast uh, with respect to radius function R. And by using this, uh, we can uh, immediately prove that uh, the restrictions of the G2 monopoles along this distance cut uh, the, the boundary of the distance cut, distance cut uh, of uh, of length r uh, on the on the end of uh, the conical end of the manifold, this converts at infinity to a pair consistent of connection, which is pseudo Hermitianian used with respect to this nearly Cayley structure, and and uh, such that this connection here uh, leaves parallel this Higgs field. So with the Higgs field, 
at infinity is non-zero, meaning that the mass is non-zero, then this connection here is reducible. And pseudo Hermitian induced condition, uh, we'll not go into this, but uh, is, uh, is another gauge theoretical uh, condition, which is, is really uh, important in uh, nearly Kähler geometry, which is uh, precisely the analog of Hermitian use on the Kähler geometry. Just to show you that the decay rate of, of this guy is sharp, uh, it's a very simple argument. You notice that by by the fact that this guy is zero, if you write these as nabla phi wedge star nabla phi, and use this condition, you can write these the, the guy over here as a d of this guy, uh, in the same way that we did before. And so by Stokes, Stokes theorem, we get this, but uh, we have maximal volume growth. This guy grows like r to the six, and we know that we have finite uh, mass. So this is bounded on the whole manifold by mass. So if this guy, is, uh, this guy uh, goes to zero faster than r to the minus six, then using the fact that this guy is integrable, we can write this integral on the whole manifold as this limit. And we bound this by m and this by something that uh, goes to zero faster than this. So this is zero. So we cannot have, uh, some decay which is faster than this. This is the best we can, we can have. Okay, so I don't have time to go into some uh, of the ideas of the proof. So I will skim over to uh, to a new application of these decay rates that uh, does not appear on the archive. How many minutes I have left? Sorry. Minus two. Ah, sorry. Uh, should I continue for five minutes or stop here? Um, maybe you can stop and then and then let's see. Let's take okay. some questions first, and then then you can okay. yourself can ask a question. But maybe okay. maybe we can wrap up at this point and then take some questions. So let's thank Daniel. Okay. Please. So, have you got any questions about the results so far? Um, if not, maybe let, let me let, let me ask a question about what, what I think would come up later. Because you did mention that you had, um, besides studying the asymptotic behavior, you you could also establish a, a Fredholm model for the moduli space of these. Yeah. Right. So maybe can you sketch that part? So, so how far did you manage to go in this Fredo model? Did you manage to identify obstruction? I mean, do, do you understand the obstruction theory? What, what do you understand in terms of the Fredo model for this? So, so actually, to be honest, we don't know uh, much about it. Uh, what I can say is that the, the proof of this theorem works out uh, uh, well, the, the tools we use to prove these, which is uh, Hardy's inequality, some uh, Agamemnon trick, and so forth, uh, uh, also applies to the solutions of the linearized G2 monopole equation. And we can prove uh, the, an the analog of this theorem for those. And uh, so we, we know how the linearized solutions decay. And by knowing this, we know precisely which weight function we should take on the Lockhart McCohen spaces that we should complete the, the functional spaces uh, which are relevant for the model I theory. But we didn't, we haven't done this yet. Uh, and a doable open problem is to compute uh, the index of the linearized operator in this thread home setup. Uh, but we are working on it. Uh, but uh, well, I think that's what I, what I have to say about this. Actually, I was I was I was about to is the deformation the complex elliptic? Is 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 the problem elliptic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. G two monopole equation is, is elliptic. Even if the G two structure is not closed, is an elliptic equation uh, that linearized combined with the Coulomb gauge condition is elliptic. 
but uh, but yeah, some of the open problems. I don't know if I can mention. Yeah, is this tell us about the open I, problems. That's great. So 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 to compute this index that I just mentioned. Uh, so there are those those new examples of uh, non-compact etiolomy metrics by Foxcolo, Haskins, Nordstrom. So one great thing to do. Uh, we, we need testing ground, so to construct G2 monopoles on these. Actually, they construct also not, not only asymptotically conical manifold, but also asymptotically locally conical manifold. Uh, most of them are, are of this type. Uh, one work in, in progress with, with Gonzalo is uh, to analyze the limiting behavior of, uh, uh, of these monopoles when the mass parameter goes to infinity which I've done uh, uh, in part in my thesis, but uh, with those new results in these general cases, uh, we, we hope to understand more this because there's a conjecture by Donaldson Seagram saying that uh, these monopoles should, in this limit, should concentrate along a co-associative cycle. And this, so an, in, an invariant in counting G2 monopoles should be related to a count of co-associatives. Uh, which is another conjecturally uh, putative invariant that people uh, hope to find. Uh, one can, by this limiting behavior, you can inverse the problem and start with a compact ridge co-associative co in your manifold and try to construct a sequence of G2 monopoles uh, uh, concentrating along it. Uh, and finally, we can try to extend this G2 monopole theory, theory to compact manifolds by uh, allowing singularities, because otherwise, uh, as I, I mentioned before, it would be just this G2 instantons. And this theory should be for a pair. Uh, you fix a co-associative, and you study G2 monopoles with direct type singularities along this co-associative. This should give, give you some uh, sort of Maybe this, this has a hope to also define some kind of invariant in the compact case, and that's. If you start with um, if you start with um, with singular G two monopoles on building blocks, can you envisage gluing them on the, along the twisted connected sum? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, this is a very uh, theoretically speaking. Uh, I, I've 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 thought about it, but uh, I've never uh, tried it. But uh, I think it's a doable problem. It's, a doable. it's doable. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's doable. Okay. Okay. That's uh, uh, keep me posted on this last point. The previous ones are obscure for me because they're Gonzalo's expertise. But the, if you want to do twisted connected sums of single edge two monopoles, I'm definitely interested in that. Yeah. Great. I think this is good stuff. So okay, have you any more questions? Oh yes. Yeah, Shubha, so, go ahead. So, are there any like examples of G two monopoles on compact uh, torsion-free G two manifolds with Dirac type singularities? Uh, like yes. So okay. there is a paper by Gonzalo, okay, in which he constructs some uh, non-trivial examples of those. Uh, it's okay. called uh, G two monopoles with singularities. You can find it okay. in the arc. I see. Okay. Okay. So he does it on compact circle. Well. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you if smooth monopoles don't make don't really make right. sense on the compact. Right. Ones, right. So if you, yeah. you, you they have to be singular if, if they're gonna be there at all. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is the analog of uh, like direct monopole on R three, right? It has this okay. singularity on the origin. So in this theory. Uh, so it's a co-dimension three thing, so mm -hmm. should should be, have singularity along the uh, yeah. So I guess in R three, then it should be. Is it ha is it true that it is along points then, in R three? Uh, uh, I don't think. I don't know if. Uh, sorry. Uh, if uh, okay, are you saying that okay? If you have a G two monopole. No, not a G two monopole. Like a monopole in three dimension. Then, okay. then the singularities occur along, like they are just points, I guess. 
Uh, yes, it's coordination yeah, theory they, phenomenon. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah, I think they should be. They should be. I don't know if there is a general theorem stating something like, ah, if you get a G2 monopole, which is smooth, uh, I mean, uh, outside the codimension three set, then I, I, I mean, sorry, I don't know if, what would be the hypothesis, mm -hmm. but a singular, it's a bit, uh, I don't, it could be singular along a, a lot of. Okay, and did you like use the, uh, did you like really use the torsion freeness of the G two structure, or was only co closed enough? uh we do use okay uh be, because because uh we use uh a lot the young Mills higgs equation which okay, i'm sorry i was not here in the for some part of which the talk. follows sorry which which follows because we we have these both conditions both conditions i see uh, okay yeah because if you take da of this you have to use bianchi and these guys zero, close, okay. and, yeah yeah, I and see. this is very important to compute Bochner formulas, which we use a lot. Oh, I see. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, but so you you use that that it's torsion free because you use the Young Mills equation. Is that right? Yeah, because we yeah because we use Young Mills Higgs equation. Well, but careful. Okay. Uh, well, at, le at least now that I, I I could talk about this. Okay, go go ahead. Sorry. No, what I was going to remind you is that in some particular cases, uh, yeah. the connection, uh, you may be in a setting which is not torsion mm -hmm. free, but in and the you still have. And Mills. Yes, yes. Um, let me. So it depends on the example. I think it depends on the setup. So will that be, yeah. will that be a setup when you, you have a nearly G2 manifold? Oh, but they're compact. So, so it will be, I guess, reducible maybe. Yeah, maybe for the yeah. singularity theory. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, we have but, another but, question, but, I think, from Andres. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Daniel. No, no, no sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So there's a there's a question from 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 the organizer. Can a monopole <laughs> be a Donaldson Thomas connection? Uh, in which what is a Donaldson Thomas connection? Uh, with, what is the equation we are but, speaking? Yeah, I'm not sure what, what you mean, Andres. I think it's the microphone is not working. Maybe it's the deformed G2 instant on, I guess. Ah, G, okay. Uh, uh, no, I mean, uh, I've been working on, on, on also on the deformed G2 case, G2 instant case. They have some uh, similarities in the analysis uh, because in both of them, uh, quantity, which is, F wedge F wedge phi uh, appears in both of the cases to to be problematic, uh, but but I don't see a strong relation between them other than uh, they are similar, uh, but I uh, I mean G two monopoles does not solve I, I would I would guess in general they do not solve the deformed G2. Okay, so no. Okay, uh, guys, we're I mean, slightly uh, over time. It could be, so, but uh, I didn't check, sorry. All right. So um, next week uh, we're gonna have, uh, so so let's, let's thank Daniel again, please. And uh, um, 